Good evening, Rabbi. Oh, hey, Bob. How are things in uh, Jacksonville? Great. Uh, how's weather was here is good. One rainy day out of the uh, two weeks we're here. Uh, not bad. Can't complain. Okay. We miss I, you I, here I, in Sharon, but we're a little jealous of the sun exposure that you're getting. <laughs> oh, yeah. And cloudy where you guys are? Uh, rainy? It's cloudy, or? cloudy and cold. Yeah. Right. I'm bringing back my winter coat. <laughs> Uh, how's uh, how's Rachel and Jason doing? Well, the family's doing good. Good. They're looking good. Busy. Yeah. See, see the grandchildren. A lot of fun. Good. Um, so glad to hear you're having some time. Do they live uh, close to uh, a beach or a pool? Uh, they live a few blocks away from the shore. They have their own pool in the in the in, in the backyard. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, that is nice. Although we haven't uh, used it because it was actually a little too chilly to, to go swimming. We did go, we walked along the beach today. There's a, a fantastic beach uh, in, near Ponte Verde. It's right along the Atlantic Ocean. And it's, uh, it's called the bon Boneyard uh, because of the trees. It's obviously, we've had uh, ecologically uh, these trees originally were in the woods and the land must have receded or the water advanced because they're now like, they're literally uh, trees that are, uh, uh, are probably going to, in another maybe million years, they'll be fossilized. Oh, cool. So, but right now they're just laying on the beach. It's a real artwork, nat nature's artwork of uh, trees that are totally, uh, uh, are laying sideways, and some of them are actually in the salt water, part of the ocean. Uh huh. Wow, that's a fascinating uh, phenomena. I'll have to send some pictures. Yeah, please do. Worth looking at. Yeah. <laughs> Excuse me for a minute. I just have to get a tissue before we get started. Okay. Okay. Rabbi, you're holding the class actually in the shul, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, the old in the background, yeah. Uh, my, my suggestion is that if anybody's, you know, making comments or speaking, it's hard to hear what their comments are. So maybe you might repeat, repeat the question so that okay. those of us who are on Zoom will actually hear what's going on. That's a good good suggestion. I'll, uh, I'll do my best. If I forget, just uh, remind me. Okay, no problem. I apologize uh, that last week uh, we didn't have class, but I was actually uh, in Manhattan getting a tour of uh, the Met by a new uh, Jewish and Orthodox uh, docent. Fantastic. Uh, it was Ooh. really phenomenal. So there were lots of uh, great. Uh, That's for sure. Yeah, it's such there a. Was that any performance going on or? No, it, Wednesdays the Met is closed to the public, so it was just um, private audiences. Oh, that's and, great. Yeah, so it worked out. Uh, it worked out nicely. Very nice. Um, All right, I'll mute. I'll mute myself because I know you want to start. Okay. Yeah, some people are just uh, coming in, but we have a nice crowd uh, here on Zoom. I'm gonna paste the uh, source sheet. Uh, in the chat. Um, hey guys, how are you? Hmm. 
How is the Shabbos uh, leftover debate going? Uh... <laughs> Uh, <laughs> depends who's cooking, I gather. <laughs> yeah. Uh, great. Over? No. Uh, okay. <laughs> Sometimes when I drive, I feel super guilty. <laughs> okay. Okay. Is everyone online able to access the uh, source sheet? I put it in the chat. So you should be able to pull it up by clicking on the chat. Um, I, I realize that it's easier for you to scroll through the sources yourself um, because there are four pages of sources and it's hard for me to go back and forth uh, while I'm sharing screen. So if you can access um, the source sheet by clicking the link, it'll take you right to the Safari page. And that will... Uh, hopefully make it a little bit easier to follow along. We're gonna spend most of the time on the first page. Okay. Is someone at the door? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the FOB system is not a perfect system. <laughs> Oops. Okay. Hey, how are you? No, you're welcome to take. Uh, everyone's just keeping their distance. That's fine. Um, okay. Just going to paste the sources one more time in the uh, chat for everyone to access. And we're going to get started at the two pages uh, on the L. Okay. Welcome back, everyone. I'm excited to dive into Deror Yikra together. This is actually perhaps the earliest of our Shabbat Zemirot, because it was written by Dunash ben Labrat, who was really the founder of medieval Hebrew poetry. And he was a trailblazer who lived uh, early on in the 10th century in Andalusia, which is the southern coast of Spain. And he brought um, he brought um, Arabic um, meter into Hebrew uh, into the Hebrew language. Hey, Amir, welcome. Okay. Um, so he uh, in the class that I took when I was in graduate school on medieval uh, poetry, I studied with uh, Peter Cole who is uh, just um, a, a gentle uh, figure who is just so graceful. And if you have ever a chance to listen to him, he's just has the persona of a poet. Um, and he did a lot of translation of medieval uh, Hebrew poetry into English. And I want the first uh, po poet that he profiles in his uh, compendium of Hebrew poetry for Muslim and Christian Spain is um, from Dunash uh, ben Labrat. And so I'm going to just read the first paragraph um, of this chapter on him to give us a little bit of a flavor for his biography. He was a very colorful figure and really um, uh, in incredibly, um, I would say, innovative in bringing the Arabic meter to the Hebrew language. So by all accounts, the founder of the new Andalusian Hebrew poetry, Dunash ben Labrat, reimagined the very nature of Hebrew verse and 
with that conceptual and tactile shift brought about a revolution in Jewish letters and the world onto which they open. Just how and why did he, uh, just how and why he did, that remains something of a mystery as we have little more than an outline of his life. Born in the first third of the 10th century in Fez, Morocco, he traveled to Baghdad in his youth in order to study with the greatest scholar of the day, Rav Sadia Gaon. While in uh, Bavel, Dunash adopted Arabic poetry's quantitative meters to Hebrew and showed the results to his teacher, who offered up the distinctly ambiguous judgment, nothing like it has ever been seen in Israel before. He was in Spain, it seems, by age 30, having brought with him the new, poet the new uh, poetics and all they implied. Um, Dunash's Arabizing method caught on, despite his arrogant manner and his scorn for what he considered the provincial ways of the backward Spanish Jewish literat literati he encountered in Andalusia. And though he was accused, among other things, of destroying the holy tongue by casting it into foreign meters and bringing calamity upon his people, sometime around 960 he displaced Menachem ben Saruk as the reigning poet at Chastai ibn Shaprut's Jewish Cordovian court. Dunash's liturgical poems were soon sung in every town and city, in every village and country. His secular verse also gained many admirers and marked the beginning of a tradition that would last for centuries in Spain and continue on after that in North Africa, Palestine, Yemen, Turkey, Italy, and elsewhere. We don't have too many of his poems, but um, the two, uh, two of the maybe dozen or so that we have we are very familiar with, and we know which poetry is his because his name is all over his poetry. So if we look at um, the Dvor Yikra, we'll notice his name embedded within each verse. Um, so the first uh, verse, uh, the first stanza, you can see that the first letter in each line is Dalid and then Vav and then Nun and then Shin, right? The door Vim Sarchem, Ne'im and Shavu, spelling out Dunash. Again, in the second stanza, Derosh, Vaot, Natash, She'e. And then again, Derosh, Vagam, Netot, Shema. Um, and the fourth stanza is a little bit more cryptic. You have to dig and hear he, in the second to last uh, word in the line, Bamidbar, and Barosh, there's a Dalid and the Vav, and then the last word on the line, the Len Mizhar has a Nun. And then the first um, word on the fourth line is Shalomim. So that's the Dunash. And similarly, in the fifth stanza, it's the second letter or third letter in each word of every line. The Hadoch is the Dalid, the Mog has the Vav, the Venarchiv is the Nun, and then the Lashoninu is the Shin. And then in the sixth verse, back to where he started with the first letter of each stanza being the Dalit, Vav, Nun, and the Shin, and De'e, Vihi, Nitzor, and Shemor. So there's no ambiguity about who wrote this. He doesn't leave a single stanza without his imprint on it. Is that a Jewish name? Dunash? Um, I think uh, he says in here that it comes from... Uh, somewhere else. Do you know, Emil? It's either Arabic or Arabic. Yeah. Um, he, he, it doesn't sound Jewish, but he does say in here um, where it's from. I'm not sure uh, if I can find it right now, but it uh, doesn't sound like it is uh, a Jewish name. But many of the Hebrew uh, uh, Jewish poets had names that um, were acculturated names um, in, um, in, in, uh, in Andalusia, in the golden age of, uh, of Spain. Um, so we have his imprint on every uh, verse or in every stanza here. And there's another uh, piyut or poem of his that we actually uh, use on a regular basis. Anyone know which one that is? I'll give you a hint, it has to do with Sheva Brachot. So in the introduction to the benching for Sheva Brachot, 
I didn't copy this in the source sheet, but I should have. We have the Deve Haser. If we, the Deve Haser is four lines and it spells out Dunash. The Deve Haser Vagam Haron is line number one. Then the Ve'az Ilem Bashir Aron is the Vav. Nachainu Magleit Sadat is the Nun. And then the She'e Bracha B'nei Aharon. So it's clearly authored by him as it has his name on it. And it has the exact same meter as the um, as Deror Yikra. So in terms of a meter, um, I'm not such uh, an expert in this, but I am trying to um, understand um, that in Arabic uh, poetry, there was a, a consistent um, number of syllables in each line that had the same ratio or pattern of short to long syllables. And that was not anything um, that was a style of meter in Hebrew poetry that we see at all in any kind of biblical uh, poetry or any kind of other even earlier uh, Jewish poetry like some of the keynotes and other pew team from even earlier on in the Gaonic period don't have any of that style. They have a meter which has the same number of words per line or has the rhyme scheme of a full syllable, which we've traced before in past songs. But this is the first uh, song uh, or pew or poem that we have, which is clearly within the Arabic meter. And so I'll try to demonstrate what that meter is. It, 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 it is um, one short uh, syllable followed by three long. So if we look at the first line, so there's the D, which is the Shva, that's a short, and then there's Ror, Yik, Ra. Okay, so those are three vowels, um, and then L, and then Vein, Im, Bat. So there are four syllables, in uh, uh, really eight syllables, four and four, with a short followed by three long. And then there's the V, Yin, Sar, Chem, Ke, Mo, Va, Vat, Ne, Im, Shim, Chem, V, Lo, Yush, Bat, She, Vu, Nu, Hu, Be, Yom, Shabbat. And that kind of rhythm makes it really adaptable to a lot of different tunes. Uh, which reminds me that we forgot to do our uh, tradition of trying to count as many tunes as possible to this song. So maybe let's pause uh, in the midst of this meter uh, uh, um, sort of uh, exercise to uh, just list a few of the tunes that we are familiar with. So Amir, what's your favorite Dorori Kra tune? My favorite? Sing us the first verse. Okay. That's a classic. <laughs> okay. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Oh, really? Cool. Uh, so, what tune do they sing in the Beiser household? Either that one or the old. Okay. Uh, uh, Esther, you have one too? Yeah, there are several. Okay. And there is okay. a, if you listen to Zamir singing this song, we sang it in different version. Oh, yeah? Yes. Okay. So, yeah, if you look at that. Um, I'll have to look at the Zamir um, uh, album on that. Um, my, my kids like singing the one that is like the, t that, that's, it's sort of new. I think the, the Maccabees did this to the cup song. And they do the thing with the cups. 
uh, around the table. I can't ever keep up with them, but my kids and my wife uh, have fun with it. Um, yeah, I know two tunes from folk dancing. Oh yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, do you want to do you want to share the first line of one of them? I will try. <laughs> there are ye crawling, right? And I I know the steps to that. Okay, I've heard that one. That's a good one. I forgot. I forgot about that one. I haven't done that. In and a while. then there's another one that starts very similarly, but the dance is much faster. Uh huh. There were ye fra living in but the in Okay. And that's I know fantastic. my mother in law has a tune that's to one of the modern Israeli tunes, but uh -huh. I don't remember what it is. Okay. Well, to my count, we have already six uh on the uh on the table here. So that's a pretty good number. Any any other uh Additions. Okay, yes. I think. Yeah, one more. One uh, more. There's, there will we call living on part, being so thin, can more of a fun name. She must have a law, you should not share who no who pay on Shabbat. Okay, that's a new one to me. Um, but we can always count on you, Esther, for introducing a little bit more uh, of uh, culture into our community. <laughs> uh, so, Thank you for that. Um, it's so interesting. Sorry, what's interesting? The first melody I said is going with the meter of the song, which is nice. Uh huh. So I think the meter is because it's so even, it can fit a lot of different tunes, sort of like a don olam. Um, it, it's pretty malleable in terms of the different tunes that it can uh, it can fit into. Um, but with so that meter is the same as deve haser vegam haron. Um, in terms of the short followed by the long syllables. Um, but Menachem ben Saruk, who was one of his interlocutors, and they really argued with each other vociferously uh, because um, uh, Dunash really created a new system of Hebrew grammar. And um, part of how he m melded the Arabic meter was by bending some of the rules of classic grammar. So there was a fight that the two of them had about the third line here in the song of Ne'im Shimchem Velo Yushpat. It should be Na'im. Uh, when you say something is um, pleasant, it's Na'im, not Ne'im, right? But he did it as Ne'im in order to fit the Arabic meter. And um, so Menachem ben Saruk had some um, unkind words for uh, introducing, you know, that kind of uh, foreign, um, you know, uh, influence on Hebrew, on the Hebrew language. Uh, and so there's, uh, we have some records of their back and forth exchange, uh, which got pretty, um, let's just say ugly. Uh, and they took this extremely seriously. There was a lot of a lot of power behind words and letters and language and grammar. I wish that was the source of our machloket, uh, you know, uh, nowadays. Um, yeah, but but you could say like Donat ben Lavrat neim shim because you could say that the pleasance of your name and it shouldn't be, you know gone or you should bad we need to stop so that's also it's like a smichut a construct form uh -huh. so it's like possessive the presence of your name naim uh -huh. shimpem it's it's a different meaning than naim shimpem it uh -huh. could have been your name is pleasant or the pleasantness of your name uh-huh and it shouldn't be so maybe okay, that's so it, it could be it could be referring to shimchem i guess that's maybe a way that he would have defended uh, that, but it's an atypical use of uh, the word, uh, which is standardly naim. And, also, and, and there's I'm another sorry. piece here um, at the very end of the uh, of the piyut. The last line um, is um, uh, is not consistent with the rest of the uh, poem because it says she 
uh, more Shabbat, right? That fits it. But then there's this Kod Shecha. And so um, in the Sefer that I have here on Zmirot, it notes that in all of the Geniza editions of this, uh, the word um, Kod Shecha is not there. There are several other words that replace that. Um, and that would make sense because he would not have concluded his song by changing the meter all of a sudden. So some have it as kedoshecha, as in the as in the line prior, which would keep to the short and then three long syllables. Um, so um, we'll, we'll, if we can get uh, through to the third verse, we're going to see another uh, geniza uh, sort of uh, correction to the version that we currently have. Um, Marty, did you want to share something? No, I was just going to say before, you know, that line of Neim Shimchem below Yishpat, I think if Neim Shimchem were, were smichut, the pleasantness of your name, which which, um, which, which was mentioned, uh, then I think the below Yishpat wouldn't make sense, would not make sense. You know, the pleasantness of your name, Velo Yishpat, and it will not cease. Yeah, I think I may have pointed that out uh, oh, as well. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. Um, so. Um, okay, so I think we've done a lot of um, meter. Uh, I'll just point out the rhyme scheme is very simple here. Every uh, stanza has the last syllable of each line rhyming with itself. Bat, 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 right? Ni, 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 ni. Ra, 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 ra. Har, 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 har. Na, 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 na. And shecha, 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 shecha. Okay, so that's pretty straightforward and simple. Um, unlike some of the other rhyme schemes that we've uh, seen previously. So let's uh, dive in and try to appreciate some of the intertextuality that uh, Dunash um, Ben Labrat was um, referencing as he compiled uh, this piece. Um, and then we'll take a look hopefully at some of the, theme the themes and, and how they cohere and they sort of build into a sandwich model as uh, we'll, uh, we'll get to. Okay. So Daror Yikra Levenim Bat. So Daror Yikra, of course, um, reminds us from Parshat Behalotcha with the Yovel. If we uh, look at source number two, we got to turn over the page here or scroll down. Um, um, every 50th year, V'kidashtem et shnata chamishim shana ukratem Daror Ba'aretz l'chol yoshveha. So this is Declaration of Freedom, right? This is what's on the Liberty Bell in Philadelphia. Um, there is this... Um, uh, public proclamation uh, that uh, everyone is uh, now free. And so what is this freedom that is being declared? So it's ambiguous at first. We have to uh, wait to find out what the specific nature of this drawer is, but we'll soon get there and see that it's either referring to Geula or to Shabbat or some mixture of uh, those two. Labain Im bat. So what is this uh, a reference to? Most likely uh, it's a reference to, you know, what we say in Kiddush, of lo ta'ase ko melacha, a'ata u'bincha u'bitacha avdecha v'yamatcha v'hemdecha v'hemdecha gercha asher b'sharecha, right? That it's a reference to there should be this freedom that's called to, you know, to man and to woman, to son and to, uh, to daughter. A similar refrain is uh, present in Shimur Shabto Tai, where we say, Hashomer Shabbat Babain um, uh, im, im Habat, right? Uh, so that reference is similar there, that it's supposed, some, it's supposed to be an inclusive freedom that extends mm -hmm. to the youth and to, uh, to, all, uh, to all around the Shabbos table. V'yin Sarchem Kimo Vavat, and um, you should be uh, preserved um, uh, like uh, like bavat. So what does uh, a bavat um, refer to? So this is a, a reference to the, the, the pupil of an eye. If we look um, at source number three from Zechariah, we'll see one of the several instances in Tanakh in which the Jewish people are referred to as this delicate, fragile uh, part of uh, the, the eye, which is the pupil. So if you just look at the very last three uh, a lot words of this pasuk, uh, or the last line, ki uh, hanogea b'chem, nogea b'vavat eno. So whoever touches you, it's as if they've touched the pupil of his own eye. Meaning Hashem is uh, saying to 
the uh, enemies that if they mess with the Jewish people, then it's they're like they're they're destroying themselves because they're destroying the most precious and delicate part of uh, their vision. Um, so Hashem will protect you, uh, knowing that you are so fragile and also so precious to Him. And back to this Ne'im Shimcham Velo Yishpat, I think we've already uh, covered. Um, and then Shivu Nuhu Biyom Shabbat is a reference to uh, a pasuk in, uh, we'll look at source number four quickly here. This is uh, in regard to the, uh, the man where uh, Hashem uh, tells the, uh, the Jewish people that on Shabbat, I'll just go to the second half of the verse here, Shavu ish tachtav, each person should sit wherever they are. Al ish mim kamo biyom hashvi'i. A person should not leave their place once Shabbat starts the entirety of the seventh day. This, of course, is the source of Tchum Shabbat, that we should not walk beyond 2,000 amot, beyond Makom Hashvita, the place that we are settled in at the onset of Shabbat. So this uh, last line of the first uh, verse is a reference to the fact that Shabbat is a time for resting and staying put. So who is the audience of this first verse? It is uh, written in the second person to the people who are sitting around the table singing this Shabbat Zemer, right? V'yin sarchem, shivu, right? That you're going to be protected. Uh, Shavu is in the second person that you should rest and you should sit on Shabbat. So here, clear the, clearly the theme is one of Shabbat. Um, and um, we're going to see that shift in the second uh, stanza uh, until we get to the last, the sixth stanza, where it's going to shift back to Shabbat. Yeah. Right. So that's another uh, layer here. The translation here uh, adds that in, um, I think, as sort of a, 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 a colloquial phrase that's uh, used to talk about how something is special and unique. Right. And so that's uh, the way that Hashem is praising us, that he will protect us because we are so special and so unique. Um, uh, maybe like a son and a daughter is. So the freedom here that is being proclaimed seems to be the freedom to be, be to desist from the labor of the work week, and we can be free from that toil um, and that burden and have this shvita and this uh, menucha. Um, okay. Um, so uh, continuing in the second uh, stanza here, derosh navi ve'ulami. So uh, seek um, navi uh, and ulami are referring to places. Uh, nave, um, let's look at source number five to see what nave refers to from Zekeli Anvehu from the Shirat Hayam. So Rashi here says on the song of the sea, Va'anvehu unklus tirgem lashon nave that Unkelos translates it as a place of dwelling, as in Navesh Anan, like a peaceful habitation in Yishayahu. Um, so this is referring to the Beit HaMikdash. So we're, we're asking, right, Derosh Navi, right, seek um, my resting place, the Ulami and my great hall. So that is the Paitan, the poet, asking uh, for Hashem to... Uh, um, restore the Beit HaMikdash, the Ot Yesha Ase'imi, and to make the sign of salvation uh, for me. Uh, so what is the Ot of salvation? What do we call Ot? Both. Both. Okay, so, but here, more likely, it's a reference to Shabbat. All right, um, as we sing in the Shamar Vene Yisrael, Shabbat, Lasash, Latamik Lam, Bein of Yisrael, Oti Leolam, right? That it is a sign for all of the nations about the special, unique uh, uh, relationship between Hashem and the Jewish people. Um, 
So Nata Sorek Bitoch Karmi. Again, we're asking Hashem here. It's shifted to a request to Hashem. It's no longer talking to the group of people sitting around the Shabbos table uh, to plant a sorek, which is a, a special kind of uh, 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 branch uh, within my vineyard, she'e shavat b'neami, and to consider the cries of my people. Both of these last two lines are resonant uh, verses in, in Tanakh. If we look at six and seven in the source sheet, we can appreciate uh, that uh, Yeshayahu in giving uh, his vision of uh, the days to come, uh, I bolded them just for the sake of uh, expediency here, where he talks about Kerem Hayali Didi Bekeren Ben Shamen, that there is this special vineyard for his uh, beloved, and then Vayatehu Sorek, that he will plant a special shoot a special vine within that vineyard. So that is a reference to the shoot of Mashiach ben David. So we're asking Hashem to plant and to start the process of growing the Mashiach and the good times ahead. And She'esha Avat B'nei Ami is taken from the Haftorah for Tisha B'Av when Yirmiyahu is asking Hashem to listen to the cries of pain, of suffering. Uh, this is in source number seven. Uh, that alas, here is the voice of my uh, nation, uh, of, my, of my downtrodden nation from the foreign and far out places. Okay, so this is a request for Geula. This is a request for the place uh, that Hashem calls home, the Beit HaMikdash in Eretz Yisrael. Again, this is being written from uh, from from uh, from Spain, so uh, they are dreaming of um, of uh, kibbutz galuyot, the Binyat Beit Hamikdash, uh, by listening uh, to the cries of the Jewish people in Galut. Uh, continuing with stanza number three, deroch pura betoch batzra, that they sh- uh, it's asking Hashem to trample. Um, the uh, the grapes or the the wine press that is in Batra. Batra is the capital of Edom. The Gam Bavel Asher Gavra and also Bavel, which became very strong. Netoch Sarai Be'afe Avra. You should uproot and my uh, those that trouble me with anger and with um, Avra is like rage. Shema Koli Biomekra, and listen to my voice on the day that I call. So this um, stanza is based on a prophecy of Yeshayahu in source number eight, where the uh, most of these lines come from these three psukim. If we look at Pasuka Gimel at the end here, we say, Pura Darachti Levadi, that I trod out the vintage uh, alone. Uh, so I've trodden out the pura, which are like the the the, the grapes, um, and the uh, pasuk aleph says mize ba me adom chamut begadim mi batra. Who is this that's coming from Edom? Chamut begadim is like with um, stained clothing, uh, not just any stain, but red stain mi batra. So this is a reference to uh, 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 people returning from Edom with blood on their garments because they have taken revenge on Edom. Um, and Batra is the capital of Edom. So the uh, crushing of grapes that creates this redness is sort of this metaphor for revenge on the archetypal enemy of the Jewish people, which is Edom. Uh, Esav, who Edom is a descendant of Edom, which was associated with the Roman Empire and Christianity. Um, uh, so the question that uh, the scholars ask on this uh, stanza is what does Bavel have to do here? It says, Vegam Bavel Asher Gavra. Where was uh, Dunash living when he wrote this? In Bavel. And was Bavel a good host to the Jewish people? Very much so. So why would he be uh, ranking on uh, uh, the Babylonians, who were a good host country to him. They had destroyed the Beit Hamikdash, which was actually prior. Yeah, um, again, 
So it's possible um, that it was a reference um, back to um, a previous uh, enemy of the Jewish people. But when he's asking um, Deruch Pura Betoch Batzra, he's asking for a contemporary enemy to be destroyed, right? The Christian, the, 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 the right? In Babylonia, there was a Muslim majority. They were in a Muslim country. Um, and they were still, there were still persecutions from the Christians. Um, so it's possible that it's going backwards in history, but it seems to be asking about uh, the present or the future. Um, so in the, um, in the Geniza fragments um, of this uh, piyut, um, the words uh, Bavel are not there. Let me just look at my notes to see what exactly replaces it. Right, it is Vigat um, Bavel Asher Gavra. Not Bavat, Bavat, excuse me, Vigat Be'edom Asher Gavra. I misread that. So the Gat um, is again a word that is used in the prophecy of Yeshayahu that we just read at the end of Pasuk Bet, um, which uh, refers to uh, like uh, grapes and the Gat the uh, Edom. Asher Gavra, um, Edom would be referring to um, the, um, uh, the, the same uh, 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 group that Ishayahu was referencing in his prophecy as Me'edom Chamut Begadim Nibatsra. And it would be more parallel to Diroch Pura Batok Batsra, the Gat, the Adom, Asher um, Gavra. So why would that be taken out? So there were censors that came along uh, when the uh, Jews were in a Christian majority country who were uncomfortable with their uh, people being called out so explicitly. And so like we've seen in many other instances that was replaced uh, with something that was less um, political and less inflammatory, uh, the Gam Bavel. So when exactly that happened, we don't know, um, but uh, it's peculiar that Bavel is in there because it was not a contemporary enemy of the Jewish people, which uh, sort of uh, corroborates the fact that the, in the Geniza uh, 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 editions, it is not there because it actually originally was written about Edom. Okay. Any comments on that? Okay, so if you want to cross it out in your benchers and uh, write uh, the Gat of the Adom, you would be uh, 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 correct uh, and more uh, intellectually honest. Um, so Netot Sarai Ba'af Avrash Mak Bolibi Um So that is, uh, uh, we already read this about destroying enemies and listening uh, to my voice. Um, in the fourth stanza, we have a spin on a utopic vision in source number nine and 10 of Yeshayahu, who paints the desert blooming again in the time of uh, Mashiach. And he lists several kinds of blossoms and, um, and trees that will uh, be present in the barren desert. He says, So the Barosh Tidhar and the Hadash Shita, those four are picked up uh, by Dunash, as he says, Hadash Shita Barosh Tidhar, that Hashem should make the desert bloom again with these four, with the myrtle, the acacia, the cypress, and the elm tree. Lamas here, Vilanis Har, and to those that guard and watch over Shabbat. Shalom uh, Tain Kemei Nahar. They should be given this river of calm and peace. And again, uh, Yishayahu references this Nahar Shlomecha, that uh, there should be this uh, flowing, uh, generously flowing river of, uh, of peace. Hadoch Kamay El Kana. So El Kana, of course, we know from the third commandment of that God of uh, of passion or of, of jealousy, right? That you should crush those that stand up against me as you are uh, a jealous God, the Mogle and make their hearts melt or with, with um, 
with uh, anguish, um, ube ma gina, um, and with uh, with grief, venarchi pe malena, and then let our mouths open wide, ule shonenu lecharina, so that we can ha- sing um, these joyous songs to you. And then finally, the et chachmalena shecha. This is uh, an explicit uh, uh, verse from Mishle in which uh, Shlomo is asking Hashem to cause uh, our soul uh, to know uh, the Torah, right? And here there's a shift back to the uh, people sitting around the table. It's not a reference to God anymore. It's instructing the audience here that they should cause their souls to gain wisdom which is the crown of your heads, right? It's not referring to Hashem there. Hashem doesn't need the wisdom. It's the people that need it. You should guard the mitzvah that is so holy, to guard the Shabbat um, of your holiness. Um, and uh, this uh, is a reference to the way that Shabbat is uh, described. This is the 15th uh, source. Shabbat uh, uh, that Shabbat is described specifically as something which is Kadosh Lachem. So we have in the sixth uh, verse here a return back to the initial theme of Shabbat. In the four intermediary uh, stanzas, uh, it is a theme about Geula, and it really alternates. The second stanza of Derosh Navi is about something good for us. Derosh Kura is bad for them. Elokim Tema Midbar Har, Hadashita is good for us, and then Hadoch Kamai El Kana is bad for them. So Galut um, uh, and Geula is sort of the reference there that the Galut should be reversed by our enemies being destroyed, and then it should be good for us. Or it should be good for us, and then the enemy should be destroyed, it should be good for us, and then the enemy should be destroyed. And then in both the first and last stanza is a reference to Shabbat. That's that sandwich model that I referenced uh, a moment ago. Uh, that it begins with Shabbat and ends with Shabbat, but we could argue that there's actually a progression that goes on between the first and the last stanza. The first stanza is about Shivu v'nuchu b'yom Shabbat. It's about laying back, resting, not being so active, being free from. And the last stanza is about filling that time with spiritually elevating activities like learning um, and, and observing the mitzvot. Of, uh, of Shabbat. So there is some perhaps um, sort of uh, 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 movement from uh, as a result of singing the song in which one is filling the time and the space of Shabbat with something that's meaningful that will ultimately move us from Shabbat to a place of redemption because Shabbat is, as we've said before in reference to other songs, is uh, like a me'en olam haba. It's a taste of the redemption. But only if we fill it with the proper things um, like learning and singing and doing the mitzvot of Shabbat. So that's um, what I have to say on, uh, on this song. There are a few things we didn't get to, but I think we rushed through it sufficiently. Uh, any uh, comments or observations on, uh, on this seminar? It's what? Yeah. So he, he really uh, has to, in order to stay within that meter, uh, he has to, he really massages a lot of words. Um, and some would argue that he uh, massages them uh, with uh, a little too much effort and uh, not enough uh, regard for their integrity. Uh, but this was the style that he revolutionized and that he brought uh, and he was the first of, of dozens um, to use Arabic meter for Hebrew poetry. So this is really the first of a genre that we see uh, through the, the Dror Yikra and through uh, the Devei Haser, which really caught on for, uh, for centuries to follow. Well, I hope this uh, enhances your Shabbat table this week. Sorry. I, uh, and uh, next, any any uh, requests for next week? Well, just a question, just a comment, maybe. Maybe it's not apropos, yeah. but I think he felt that the meter was the importance because it was, if it was to be remembered, if it was to take on the importance of 
you know, of uh, being generational uh, instead of just a poem, which sometimes is, can be forgotten. This is one has really to, uh, be, uh, proven the test of time. So maybe he massaged a few of the meanings, but he really- Yeah. The, the meter definitely makes it more catchy and uh, makes it more memorable. Uh, we're going to transition here to uh, to Ma'ariv, but I'll thank everyone who is online for uh, joining and participating, and I wish everyone an Erev Tov. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you.